In this lecture, we're going to study the important primitive of pseudorandom functions and their practical instantiation via block ciphers. Informally, a pseudorandom function is something that looks like a random function. So before we can talk more about pseudorandom functions, uh, let's first make sure we understand something about random functions. Let's define func n to be a set containing all functions mapping strings of length n to strings of length n. The first thing we can ask is how big is this set? How big is the set func n? Well, we can specify any function by its inputs and their corresponding outputs. So here, for the case of n equals 3, I've drawn a table specifying for each possible 3-bit input a corresponding 3-bit output. So the string 0, 0, 0 maps onto the string 0, 1, 1, and so on. Now, in fact, you can notice that the first column here is redundant. We don't need to store the list of inputs in their lexicographic order. We can instead just let that be implicit by the ordering in the table itself. So now we just have a single column, a large array, containing in each entry a 3-bit string. And just as before, we can say that the first input, i.e. 0, 0, 0, maps on to the first value in this array, i.e. 0, 1, 0, and so on up until the last possible 3-bit input, 1, 1, 1, which maps on to the last element of this array, in this case, 0, 0, 0. So we have this array con containing 3-bit values, and this array is of size 2 to the third, right? Because we have all possible 3-bit inputs, there are 2 to the 3 such inputs, so we have a total of 8 inputs, or 8 values, rather, uh, in our array. In general, we can represent a function from n-bit inputs onto n-bit outputs by a similar array, where the array is going to be now of length 2 to the n, with one entry corresponding to every possible n-bit input, and each entry of that array containing an n-bit value, representing the corresponding output. So we can represent a function in func n using exactly n times 2 to the n bits. Again, that's an array of length 2 to the n, with an n-bit entry uh, in each element of the array. Since we have also a correspondence in the other direction, that is, if I take any array of length 2 to the n containing n-bit strings in each entry, that defines a function in func n. And this is, in fact, a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping from arrays of length n, uh, sorry, arrays of length 2 to the n containing strings of length n to functions from n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs. That tells us that the size of func n is exactly equal to the number of strings of length n times 2 to the n. That is, the size of func n is just 2 to the n times 2 to the n. Note that this is huge. This is doubly exponential in our parameter n. But nevertheless, it's a finite set. So there's nothing funny going on. We don't have to worry about continuous uh, probabilities or continuous random variables or anything like that. We're still in the setting of a very large but still finite set. Now, when I talk about a random function, what I really mean is a uniform function, but I'm just allowing myself to be a bit informal. So what do we mean, uh, more carefully speaking, by a random function or by a uniform function? Well, very simply, uh, this means that we choose a uniform function in this finite set func n. So when I talk about a random function from n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs, I mean we just pick a uniform function, a uniform member of this set func n. It's a little bit difficult to think about this uh, or to conceptualize what that means, uh, so we can think about it in an alternate way. This is exactly equivalent to just filling out the function table we saw in the previous slide with a uniform value in every entry. That is, we can imagine starting with a blank table, and then for each possible input, that is, each possible x of length n, we simply choose the corresponding entry in the table corresponding to the value of the function on that input with a uniform value uh, in 0, 1 to the n. That is, we imagine having a table of length 2 to the n, and we simply fill in every entry with a random or a uniform n-bit string. Now, in fact, rather than thinking about this being done all at once, we can also equivalently think about this being done on the fly as values are needed. That is, I can, uh, it's equivalent to 
uh, to me choosing a uniform f and then probing the value of that function on a bunch of different points, x1, x2, x3, that's equivalent to starting with an empty table and then when asked for the value of f of x1, I simply fill in the value at that position of the table with a uniform n-bit string, and so on for x2 and x3, just being careful that if I'm ever asked for the value of f of x1 again, I'm consistent and I choose to return the same value that I returned before. So the point is that there are these two equivalent, or three, I guess, equivalent ways of thinking about what it means to choose a uniform function from n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs. Now again, a pseudorandom function is intuitively a function that looks like a uniform function or a random function. But as in our discussion of pseudorandom generators, it doesn't make sense to talk about any fixed function being pseudorandom. And what we're going to do, to do instead is look at keyed functions, which allow us to define a distribution over functions from n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs. So let's let capital F be a function that now takes two inputs and produces one output. And we'll always assume that this f is efficiently computable. That is, it's computable in polynomial time in the length of both of its inputs. We'll define the reduced function f sub k to be the function mapping n-bit strings, n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs, where we define it by f sub k of x is equal to f of k comma x. So we're just basically imagining fixing the first input uh, to capital F uh, to some fixed value k. Now this fixed first input is going to be called a key, and that's why I've denoted it by k. We're going to assume throughout, just for simplicity, that f is length preserving. This means that fk of x uh, is only defined if the length of k is equal to the length of x, in which case the length of the output is equal to the length of each of the inputs. Thinking a little bit ahead and thinking in terms of cryptography, this just means that for every value of the security parameter n, we have f defined for keys of length n and inputs of length n, and then producing outputs of length n as well. Now the important thing to note here is that if we choose a uniform key of length n, then that is equivalent to choosing the function f sub k mapping n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs. So by choosing a uniform key, we're choosing a function according to some distribution. We can now define a little bit more carefully what we mean by a pseudorandom function. So we'll say that this two-input function f is a pseudorandom function if f sub k for uniform choice of the key is indistinguishable from a uniform function. More formally, we require that for every polynomial time distinguisher d, d cannot distinguish between the case when it's given what's called oracle access to f sub k, or when it's given oracle access to a completely uniform function f. That is, on the left-hand side here, we have the probability that d returns 1 when d is given access to the function f sub k, where k is chosen uniformly. Giving d access to this function means that we allow d to provide inputs to the function and get back the corresponding outputs. But d can't look inside the function, as it were, and in particular can't see anything about the value k being used other than what it can potentially learn from the inputs and outputs that it sees. We compare that to the probability that d outputs 1 when it's given oracle access to a function f chosen uniformly from the set of all functions on n-bit inputs and producing n-bit outputs. And we'll, we'll define that capital F is a pseudorandom function if those probabilities are close for every polynomial time d. That is, if the difference between the probabilities that d outputs 1 in those two cases is negligible. It might be a little bit easier to understand the definition, at least on an intuitive level, by looking at a picture. So here we have a polynomial time distinguisher d, and that distinguisher is going to try to tell the difference between two possibilities. In the first case, what we do is we imagine choosing a function f uniformly at random from the set of all functions on n-bit inputs and having n-bit outputs. What it means for the attacker to interact with this function is that the attacker can specify inputs of its choice 
and get back the corresponding outputs. It can do this adaptively, that is, it can choose its next input x2 based on the output f of x1 that it receives, and it can do this as many times as it likes. One thing I'll note is that there's no real point for the attacker to ever repeat an input, because it knows that it'll get back the same output. The only randomness here is in the initial choice of f, but once we choose an f and fix it inside the box, f is then a deterministic function that always returns the same output when given any input. We're going to compare that situation to a situation where what we do is choose a uniform key, k, and then put the function f sub k inside of a box. And we allow the attacker to interact with that box, again by submitting inputs and getting the corresponding outputs. As in the first case, it can do this as many times as it likes, adaptively choosing whatever inputs it wants to feed into the box. And we'll say that capital F is a pseudorandom function. If these two worlds, world 0 and world 1, are indistinguishable from the point of the attacker. That is, the attacker can't tell whether it's interacting with a black box containing a, uh, an f chosen uniformly from the set of all functions in func n, or whether it's interacting with a box containing f sub k for a uniformly chosen key k. One thing I want to stress is that in the first case, in, in world 0, that function f is being chosen from a huge space of possibilities. Remember the size of func n was 2 to the n times 2 to the n, doubly exponential in n. Whereas on the bottom, the number of possibilities for fk is at most 2 to the n, because k is an n-bit key, and so there are, there are at most 2 to the n choices for k. So on the top, we have a distribution over a doubly exponential size set of functions, and on the bottom, we have some distribution over an exponential size set of functions. Nevertheless, uh, capital F is pseudorandom if the attacker can't distinguish these two possibilities apart. Now, we can try to connect our notion of pseudorandom functions with the earlier notion of pseudorandom generators. And if you think about it, uh, a pseudorandom function is actually much stronger than a pseudorandom generator, and it immediately implies, in particular, uh, a construction of a pseudorandom generator. That is, if we have a pseudorandom function f, then we can very easily define the following pseudorandom generator. g, on input a seed k, will just output fk of 0, 0, 0, 0, concatenated with fk of 0, 0, 0, 1. Right? So intuitively, uh, f sub k for a uniform k looks like a random function. And if that's the case, then applying a uniform function to the 0 input and then applying a uniform function to the 1 input uh, is equivalent to choosing two uniform n-bit values, n-bit outputs. And so what we get is a pseudorandom generator G that maps an n-bit seed to a 2n-bit output. In fact, there's no reason to restrict ourselves to only evaluating f twice. We can define a, a, a pseudorandom generator G with larger expansion by simply applying f sub k to more values, to more distinct values. So here I'm just defining G of k as f fk applied to 0, fk applied to 1, fk applied to 2, where we imagine we're encoding those integers as n-bit strings. More generally, we can in fact view a pseudorandom function as a pseudorandom generator with exponentially long output, and that furthermore allows random access to individual chunks of that output. That is, we can view the function f sub k uh, by looking at the entire function table for fk, that is, the value of fk on each possible n-bit input, and concatenating those all together, right? Intuitively, and this is, I'll warn you that this is not quite formally correct, this is just intuition, but intuitively, the, uh, fu the fact that fk looks just like a uniform function means that the function table for fk looks like the function table for a uniform function. So just by writing out all possible uh, values of the function on all possible inputs, we get some huge uh, table of random looking values. Where, moreover, we can access any one of those values by simply uh, evaluating fk on the corresponding input. I next want to talk about the notion of pseudorandom permutations. If we let f be a length preserving keyed function, as before, then we'll say that f is furthermore a keyed permutation if the following two conditions hold. First of all, we'll require that 
the function fk, which remember is a function from n-bit inputs to n-bit outputs, should be a bijection for every possible key k. That is, the function fk is one to one and onto for every possible choice of k. This furthermore, um, this essentially means that fk is a permutation. We'll also require that fk inverse is efficiently computable. If fk is a bijection, then fk has a well-defined inverse, and we'll just add the additional uh, efficiency requirement that we can compute fk inverse given the key k. We'll say then that f is a pseudorandom permutation if fk for a uniform key k is indistinguishable from a uniform permutation chosen from the set of all permutations on n-bit strings. Block ciphers are very important cryptographic primitives, and these can be viewed as giving us practical instantiations of pseudorandom permutations. That is, if we want to use a pseudorandom permutation in some cryptographic construction, then the right thing to do is to instantiate that pseudorandom permutation with a block cipher. Now, for a block cipher, there are no asymptotics involved. A block cipher is typically defined on some fixed key length and fixed block length, although there are cases where they, they're allowed to vary slightly, uh, and it gives a fixed uh, output length. So rather than having this function f being defined on all length inputs and all length keys, uh, we'll only have it defined for keys of a certain length, uh, here denoted by n, and what we'll call a key length, and defined only on certain input lengths m, where m is what we'll call the block length. And uh, because we want this f to be instantiating a pseudorandom permutation, we're going to require that f sub k be hard to distinguish from a uniform permutation f, but actually, for the case of block ciphers, we're going to be more stringent. So it's not going to be sufficient for uh, f sub k for uniform k to be indistinguishable from f for uh, attackers running in polynomial time. We actually want it to be hard even for attackers running in time about 2 to the n. That is, that the best attack in terms of distinguishing fk from a uniform permutation should be an exhaustive key search attack where the attacker tries to see whether any uh, key k is a possibility, that is, matches with the inputs and outputs that it's seen. It's kind of amazing, actually, that we have constructions that appear to satisfy this notion. We can't prove that they satisfy the notion of being a, a pseudorandom permutation. However, after many, many years of study, uh, no one's been able to show otherwise. And it's therefore reasonable to conjecture that they do indeed provide a secure instantiation of pseudorandom permutations. Perhaps the best known of these is AES the Advanced Encryption Standard. AES was standardized by NIST in 2000 based on a public worldwide competition lasting over three years. Essentially, teams of cryptographers were allowed to submit their proposals for block cipher constructions. And after three years of study and analysis, NIST chose uh, AES as the block cipher to be standardized. AES provides a block length of 128 bits, and it offers three different key lengths, uh, 128, 192, or 256 bits. And again, as far as we know today, uh, AES provides the security claimed on the previous slide. That is, uh, AES with 128-bit keys seems to provide about 2 to the 128 uh, security. That is, security against attackers running uh, in time 2 to the 128. And uh, really, that's very uh, that's sufficient for uh, any kind of attacker you can imagine in practice. I'll mention that AES is, uh, like I said, one of the best known block ciphers out there. And there's really no reason to use anything else. Uh, you'll find, if you look, that there are other block ciphers available. Uh, however, I can really uh, just only recommend using, the def using AES as the default block cipher in any construction. Next time, we'll show how to use pseudorandom functions, aka block ciphers, to construct CPA-secure encryption schemes.